So good afternoon, I'm Mike Duigo. I work at a company called Liquid Robotics, which is owned by uh, Boeing. And we build uh, ocean-going robots that spend uh, up to a year or more out at sea doing data collection. Um, and I'm going to be talking about running a uh, uh, writing fault-tolerant, long-running Java services. Uh, because, of course, when these uh, robots are out on their missions at sea, um, they don't really have the opportunity to be easily rebooted, upgraded, uh, bug fixed, or uh, watched over. They're, they have to be uh, very self-sufficient uh, and uh, reliable. Um, this is a picture of the robot in its most favorable conditions, kind of on the dock in Hawaii. Um, it's about the size of a sea kayak. It's a surface robot. Um, and it has a portion that is um, uh, not really visible in this picture here, but this part would be underwater between three and eight meters down. And the way it generates propulsion is, is as the waves push the body up and down, the part that's below the surface kind of remains stationary. And there's a tension on the cable between them. And that's translated into forward propulsion. So it can move a little faster than walking speed without any need for an external power supply. It does have solar cells uh, on the top, but that's just to power the computers and communications. Uh, we do have a prop as well, but we use it primarily for steering rather than propulsion. Um, and in the less favorable conditions, this is a picture of a similar type, similar robot, but those mountains you can see in the distance are actually Antarctica. Uh, so these kind of go, uh, everywhere in the world from equatorial to uh, uh, both of the poles. Uh, there's a bit of a blow up of the um, robot to show its parts, a main computer on, and batteries on board depending on the missions, especially in the high latitudes. Um, we may have a lot of batteries on there uh, to um, extend the length of the mission uh, because there's not enough power being generated by solar. Um, uh, as well as those wing assemblies at the bottom that are what generates the thrust uh, um, uh, for propulsion. So about me, I uh, um, have been working in robotics for a little over a decade. Uh, I came from uh, uh, file systems, drivers, uh, core OS type environment. But I got the opportunity to work on a bunch of uh, James Gosling's Jaffa 1 demos, including things like dancing robots, the little robot in the center, uh, a real-time Java marble sorting machine, which was an industrial automation demo. Uh, the Stanford Audi autonomous car, uh, where we did all the boring parts that were safety critical uh, in real-time Java, and then the researchers could just write their driving algorithms in MATLAB, uh, and they crashed all the time, but the car didn't crash. Um, and then most recently at Oracle, I worked on Java 8, uh, just because when you work at uh, Sun Oracle for 15 years in Java, but not actually on the Java team, it seems like a good idea to do that for a while, so I did. Um, my original exposure to reliable systems was uh, an open source project uh, that was a Sun project in the early 2000s, uh, juxta peer-to-peer, -peer, which ended up being like a container, uh, services container. Uh, which, of course, the container had to be extremely reliable even if the services themselves were uh, uh, failure prone and, and restarted often. And that's what we're talking about is durable systems. Um, systems that must continue to function as long as possible in the presence of errors. Errors should either be expected and not cause the entire system to come down. If, uh, you know, a single null pointer exception can take out everything, um, you're not going to have a very reliable system. Um, and um, the system, sh in addition to not you know, being robust uh, or sort of reliable in terms of not having those errors, when errors do occur, it should be robust enough to recover from them and uh, proceed on its way. Um, we'll start with a story of a brief tragedy. This was a project I worked on um, uh, with a customer that was part of an early customer engagement uh, of Java Realtime at, at Sun. And uh, they were um, an early adopter of uh, Realtime Java. And they were hoping to use it to update their classic ladder logic uh, PLC system that had been used in glass manufacturing. And the idea was is that um, by using software rather than uh, hand-built uh, ladder logic, they'd be able to replicate glass assembly lines much more easily and make it easier to 
put up a new one kind of anywhere they wanted to. Um, and uh, unfortunately, the first time, their first uh, experience with it didn't Kuwait go very well. So in their first week of deployment, there was a catastrophic operational failure. This system pushed 170 two meter by three meter sheets of glass past any given point on the assembly line per minute. That's about five meters per second of glass. That glass is just shooting through there. Well, uh, one particular roller didn't gap properly and the glass piled all up in one place, uh, which resulted in piles of broken glass, several, you know, almost a meter deep uh, on the assembly room floor. Uh, and it took them five weeks to clean up and they were down for two months uh, trying to figure out what, what was going wrong. And it was due to that gap sensor failing to adjust. So what broke? This was the main loop of their, um, of their program. And what it does is it, it reads the sensor, finds out what the current thickness of the glass is, adjusts the gap so that the rollers are at the correct tension to keep the glass moving. And uh, in Java real time, it's a real time operating system. You say, so you have a periodic task that's executed at a very fixed interval. And you do that task and then you say, wait for the next period. Okay, that should, that should work. So what actually broke in this case? Well, their uh, read sensor routine uh, used the Java integer parsint uh, method to read the value from the sensor. It was getting it in from uh, a serial line. Um, and the protocol was is that you wrote a carriage return and then it would immediately respond with the current uh, sensor value. And then it would try and parse that, that value and return that as an integer result. Well, what happened was is that the code in the sensor was embedded C, and it was defined as a printf 4D, which was generating a value that they had never seen before, a leading space. And of course, uh, that was not allowed by the integer parsing routine, which threw an, a number format exception, uh, which is what they caught uh, here with the ex catch exception all. And all they did was uh, print out the exception and then throw it an error. Well, this turned out to be a really bad thing uh, because um, their main loop was actually catching exception and error is not an exception. It's actually part of the hierarchy above error. Uh, so this actually exited the, th the main thread, which stopped the program from continuing to adjust the gap sensor. And all it needed was a slightly thicker piece of glass to come along um, and um, it would gum up the whole works, and that's exactly what happened. So, kaboom, an uncaught error caused the thread to exit and everything died. So the fixed version uh, was to be more general about what error that they catch, so they're catching throwable rather than exception. And now that they're, now they're even in the presence of errors, they're uh, unconditionally calling wait for next period. So they don't stop it when an error occurs. Um, <coughs> and this was, you know, kind of all that was required in order to fix the problem. They also fixed the problem uh, of the, um, the C code, which was generating that space uh, or trimming the string. I forget which one they actually did. So, you know, why this went wrong? Um, they, had, they were new to this. They were a bunch of mechanical electrical engineers writing Java code. Uh, so they weren't even experienced Java programmers. Um, and um, they didn't have strong specifications. They didn't actually know what the, uh, all the possible values that were being output by that embedded sensor were. They had just seen what they had seen, which was, oh, it seems like a bunch of numbers. Well, we'll just parse that number. Um, they didn't handle errors correctly. They didn't really have any unit testing. They had never mocked up that read sensor routine so that uh, they could pass all kinds of garbage values back, like minus one. You know, you've seen the, the joke about a QA engineer goes into a bar and uh, he orders minus one beers, he orders infinity beers, he orders X beers, he orders uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they, they needed to be doing that kind of testing all throughout their system in order to uh, validate it. And they didn't really have any integration testing at all. Um, they had never like run a piece of glass manually through the uh, entire system uh, without an operation. Um, they kind of just turned the entire assembly line on, let one piece of glass feed all the way through. Seemed fine. Well, turn the turn the knob to full, and away we go. Um, 
you know, a more methodical approach would be to not have moving motors roll the glass through first, manually push it through, make sure all the readings are okay on everything, then start to throw one sheet of glass through, then, you know, progressively, don't get up to 170 per minute uh, right off the bat. So what are we going to talk about? Some, you know, is this opinion, rules, advice? Um, this stuff mostly applies to areas of robotics, industrial automation, but it also applies to things that uh, aren't hardware. Uh, things like containers um, and other infrastructure software that needs to be just as reliable. The same characteristics would apply to a web server or a web container uh, if you're writing that kind of thing. Um, having, you know, talked to people like uh, uh, Norman Maurer who writes Netty, you know, their experiences in writing something like Netty are very, are very similar to uh, the practices that we follow in, in doing uh, robotics type stuff. Um, the other thing is, is that whatever advice you do need, you follow, you do need to do it uh, consistently, predictably, uh, and with some discipline, so that uh, um, everybody in your team is following the kind of same best practices, it's not just kind of ad hoc, sometimes we follow the rules, or, you know, some people follow the rules, but not everybody. Um, and lastly, you know, train your people well enough so that what they're doing is not just ritual practice to them. They should have an understanding of why you're doing the practices that you're doing um, and what the value in them is and maybe even uh, educate them enough so that they can argue about it uh, rather than just tell them, do this, and uh, they don't know why. Uh, that they uh, won't understand when the rule doesn't apply if they don't understand, if they don't understand why the rule exists. Uh, so that education is absolutely critical. So um, we'll t drive, dive right into it with uh, talk about throwing exceptions in your code. Um, <coughs> you know, one thing you'll see sometimes in, in a, a lot of code that's just kind of written quickly is, is it'll throw runtime exception directly, or exception, or even error or throwable. Uh, generally, you should try to avoid this. Throw only uh, specific subclasses of these bare exceptions. Um, and uh, feel free to write your own subclasses to exceptions. You can make new exception types, which are subclasses of things like a legal argument. Uh, you know, I'm surprised at the number of people who are unaware that number format exception, that one that we had for the you know, failure to parse an integer correctly, is actually a subtype of the legal argument exception. Well, you can make, you can make your own for bad URL or you know, whatever, bad JSON, whatever, uh, um, uh, type of uh, data that you're, you're handling, and, and, and do the same with other exception types as well. Um, <coughs> if you've noticed the JDK does something kind of unusual, which is that it documents methods that throw illegal argument exception, null pointer exception. This isn't required by the Java standard. Um, you don't have to, you only have to declare checked exceptions, but not runtime exceptions. However, this documentation and declaration is extremely useful. It's kind of the no surprises guarantee. Um, if you know that it's being thrown, then you have the you know, visibility to catch it. You don't have to wait until it happens in production uh, to decide, oh, I should have been catching that. Um, <coughs> and it, in the case of the JDK, it, it's actually also the basis of the, the, the test kit, the, the JD, uh, JCK, the Java Compatibility Kit. Uh, so they use it as part of specification of when does this method throw, uh, throw a null pointer exception, and they actually test to make sure that it throws when it's supposed to, uh, and, and not otherwise. But it, you know, it was useful for the tests. It would be useful in your own code if you added these declarations onto your methods in writing your own tests, um, uh, and it sure is useful for that particular. So where should you be catching the exceptions? Well, you've kind of got to catch every. Uh, exception thrown, because they're caught somewhere. But where to catch them uh, kind of depends on it, uh, on, on the situation. You need to always, you do need to always provide some kind of backstop though. Um, and normally this is of the form of like a try, catch, throwable all. Um, and this will uh, typically be, be located at the top of your, uh, your thread run, or in the case of a Lambda or runnable that you're providing to something like an executor service in, in that run method as well. Um, 
and you can also register an uncaught exception handler so that if the thread does encounter an exception uh, that wasn't caught by this throwable, which you should have, uh, or catch-all throwable, which you should have, then at least somebody will be catching it and logging it uh, um, for those particular uh, cases. So let's look at what, un what happens to uncaught exceptions and the impacts of them. In the case of a thread, if you fail to catch uh, an exception, it winds up in the uncaught exception handler and the thread is dead. Well, that, that's pretty, uh, uh, pretty bad. But it doesn't have any impact on any other threads. So only that particular thread is, uh, uh, is affected. Other threads can be affected through, uh, you know, if this was a producer thread and they're a consumer thread, uh, they may not have any new data incoming, but beyond that, they're not, uh, not affected. Timer tasks are an older Java feature for periodic actions. They're generally falling out of favor. And one of the reasons is, is that uh, if you throw a, an exception from a timer task, uh, it kills all the other timers on that same uh, timer task which is really, really unfortunate. Um, interestingly enough, uh, if you throw interrupted exception, uh, or if the thread throws interrupted exception, then um, the timer task thread is not killed, but uh, in all other cases it is. Uh, so um, uh, all the other timers in that timer task are, are killed at the same time, which is really bad. Uh, so it's one reason not to use timer task anymore. The other reason is, is because there's also now uh, executor service uh, and scheduled executor service, which are much more flexible uh, and scalable than timer task was. Um, if you have a regular future that you're using with an executor and it throws an uncaught exception, uh, you get an execution exception uh, f that is uh, caught by the, um, the executor service and it will log that. Um, it doesn't have any impact upon other uh, executables that are happening in the same executor um, and nothing further uh, has to happen. In the case of scheduled uh, future, which is one of these futures that you ask to execute on a periodic basis, um, throwing an uncaught exception is really bad in that that uh, scheduled future will never be run again. You wouldn't believe the number of stack overflow questions of my scheduled future ran once and then it never ran again, or it ran for four hours and then it stopped running and I don't know why it's not running anymore. Well, the reason is, is that it threw an exception and the uh, scheduled executor service just kind of killed it outright. So part of having that backstop practice of catch throwable at the top of the runnable is so that you yourself know when your uh, uh, scheduled executor or scheduled future is behaving badly. The last case of uncaught exceptions we'll talk about is callbacks. And this is where you give uh, somebody else uh, the opportunity to register code with you that you'll then call back under certain circumstances. So like listeners and things like that. And the bad news about callbacks is, is that other people's code is worse than yours. Um, there will be exceptions thrown by those callbacks that you're going to be required to handle. Um, and you should be protecting yourself so that their bad code doesn't uh, uh, damage your, um, your code in that uh, you want to make sure that you call all of the other listeners, that uh, the process of calling listeners isn't stopped, the event chain isn't stopped, etc. Um, so you need to protect yourself. And this is a tip, pretty typical loop that we would have in, in, a, in a program uh, for calling listeners where we've <coughs> taken the basic uh, for each listener, listener.event, and, and tell, the, tell the listener about the event, and added a try-catch throwable around it, and are logging out uh, the listener failures as they occur. You can take some further actions from this. This is kind of a sloppy uh, example, just to be short, in that I'm actually calling toString on the listener, which could it could itself throw an exception, which would uh, bump out of the loop entirely. So I wouldn't really want to do that in any kind of production code. Should I be removing the bad listeners? Is you know, everything going to fall apart if I start removing listeners that fail one time out of a thousand? Should I just let the listeners fail that one time of a thousand? What if they fall, fail every time? Oftentimes, listeners will fail because the module which registered it is no longer valid. Um, 
they've quit, but they've got this listener that they registered with you, and when you call that listener, because they've quit and their state is kind of corrupt or incomplete or shut down, they just blow up. Uh, so one possibility is to use weak listeners where you uh, use a, a Java weak reference for the listener so that if they are dereferenced and being in garbage collected, um, uh, the, the listener itself just evaporates uh, so that uh, um, you're no longer comp calling something which is basically in the process of being garbage collected. Uh, last option is to run the uh, listener using an exec executor. If these listeners are extremely time consuming, it might be reasonable to you know, make uh, uh, futures for each of these listeners um, and call all them uh, par in parallel uh, so that they, the execution happens asynchronously and you're not held up, and you can go back to handling the next event in the pipeline. Um, it, it, that depends a bit in the context. One thing we don't talk about here is, what if the listener does something that bad that's not an exception? Uh, which is that, you know, if it blocks, you know, let's say the listener decides to block on some event happening and takes four hours to execute. Well, that could really gum things up. That's one thing that, uh, goes towards using an executor, but that's not a real complete solution. I, you have to have, think of other uh, possible mitigations for bad things that a listener might do. And blocking and going in into, into an infinite loop are definitely things that uh, uh, a listener can do. <coughs> uh, we'll talk about a bit more about that in a bit. I want to uh, talk for a moment about uh, another problematic style that we encounter, which is called the ignore null style. This is where somebody writes a method that if you just pass in an argument that's null, it just pretends that you never called the method. Um, and this can be convenient and then it avoids uh, null pointer exceptions, which is presumably why they decided they just wanted to ignore the null input. But this can be uh, completely ignoring a, bu uh, a bug. And in this case, I made things worse by actually returning null if the uh, argument passed in was null. Now I've got a result from this method, which is supposed to be a string, which who's ever calling the method now has to anticipate that the, uh, the output may be null as well. Um, you know, it may be harmless if this is some simple getter setter or simple, a, a simple setter method, but what if this was the set user credential method? If I ignored the null on input, I now have a stale credential on this object, um, and that could be really bad. This could be the result of a kind of privilege escalation where I was supposed to be clearing the uh, user credential somehow or replacing it with a different value, and they substituted a null, and now they're executing a, a operation with a credential that wasn't theirs. Um, so in general, just trying to avoid the, uh, the uh, ignore null style. If you're, if you're Handling nulls by ignoring them, uh, you're probably asking for problems down the road. <coughs> so talking about that null being returned, um, <coughs> if, I, if I hand back null, I've effectively handed back a null pointer exception. Um, you know, we kind of think about it as an informal null pointer exception, and then it's not really a null pointer exception yet, but I can turn it into a null pointer exception at any time just by dereferencing it. Um, and this is a bit problematic in that um, you still have to, to handle it as if it were a, a exception already, and that's why you get into uh, post method invocation where you're looking at the result to see if the result is null and having some special handling. That's very much like a catch, as if you had thrown a null pointer exception. Um, so in, you know, in general, try and avoid uh, returning null um, if you can. Uh, if the normal result does have something that can represent the empty case or the nothing case besides null. Uh, the, the traditional example is uh, like collections.empty list or collections.empty set. Much better to return, you know, I got nothing uh, than it is to return null as the result. And there's not really much performance implication. Uh, I mean, it's not like you're creating a, a, a new object in order to um, uh, a new list or set in order to return this empty result. The uh, empty result that you get back from collections empty set is a constant. Um, 
So uh, there's, it's, it's the same as any other reference uh, cost. It costs exactly the same as returning a null, except for the function overhead, which is probably inline to get the empty, empty value. Uh, where should you catch runtime exception? Generally as close to the source as possible uh, of where it was thrown. Um, we do this in our code mostly because we're pretty paranoid about not letting these get very far. In a lot of other circumstances, um, they follow the advice of, uh, if it's a runtime exception, it's representative of a bug, uh, and therefore you should just let the entire, whatever the macro operation you're performing fail, uh, and record the failure of that operation, as well as the fact that the runtime exception occurred. Um, <coughs> we try and do the handling, uh, handling and recovery a little more locally, but that, that's a particular style choice. It can re be reflective of how much effort you want to spend on recovery uh, versus uh, just report it and give up. Um, it, it, it's, it ends up being a style choice as to, if I try it again la later, uh, might it work? Well, am I gonna have to change something before trying again? How much mitigation do I actually have to apply in order to make this thing work, ag uh, work again? And as we already mentioned, you can assume that if the, if the uh, um, runtime is not, uh, runtime exception is not declared on the method, you should consider it as being unhandled. The person that uh, is expected to handle this has no idea that the runtime exception is coming. Uh, so you should be uh, documenting the fact that the uh, uh, runtime exception can occur. Um, you know, testing for runtime exceptions is mostly a case of looking at your code coverage and making sure that you have adequate tests to generate uh, the um, expected errors uh, that can occur. <coughs> and really the only way you can you know, find the undeclared runtime exceptions is to dig into the source um, of the code which is generating them, which may be somebody else's module or library, uh, which is kind of annoying to have to do because the other alternative is wait for them to happen and fix it when it happens. Uh, and in a lot of environments, of course, that's not acceptable. Uh, you kind of got to do it up front. Um, checked exceptions are a little different in that uh, these are mostly for environmental er errors. The idea is that if it's a checked exception, um, in different circumstances, the operation could have worked. And the prototypical example of this is file not found exception. If the file did exist, well, the exception wouldn't be thrown. Um, and in some environments, that file might exist. So what you should be doing in the case of checked exceptions is doing the handling at the place where you would provide that mitigation or retry capability. If, uh, or, you know, in, in the case of something like a file not found exception, that would be uh, ask the user again for a different file path, or um, if you can't do that because there's no actual user interactively present, um, that's where you decide that you have to give up. Um, <coughs> <coughs> Hopefully the environment is not changing in ways that um, are dynamic enough that the operation is gonna work at some points and then not others. Um, if that's the case, then maybe your strategy is to uh, retry at some later time when you believe that the op operation could have succeeded again, like uh, a new, a new data, periodic data download happened and, and, the, and the result may now be valid, whereas in the previous cycle it wasn't. Um, there's two things that can kind of come out of left field in handling exceptions, and those are the two that aren't actually exception. Uh, these are uh, error and throwable. Um, you can actually, throwable is the root class of all exceptions in Java. And you can actually create one and throw it. Um, this is pretty rude uh, because there's not a much valid reason for doing this. There's lots of other exception subtypes that are always more appropriate than throwable. Uh, you know, I will allow uh, using throwable or new throwable for uh, uh, if all you want to do is print out a stack trace, but uh, in virtually every other case where you're actually sending, it, sending the exception off to some real code, you should avoid that. 
The error cases um, are for things that are detected by the VM or the environment. Um, and those would be things like SAC overflow, where you recurse too much, out of memory error, which oftentimes is not a, a true out of memory error, but can be reflective of all kinds of things like uh, out of file handles. Um, <coughs> and in the case of out of memory error, it's often not truly that the VM is out of memory, it's more likely that you made a math or a arithmetic computation and asked for uh, 50 bazillion uh, bytes of memory. Uh, bad computation is more the source of out of memory errors than, at least in what we found, than actual out of memory errors. Um, some of them are, some of the rest of these are kind of more obscure, uh, like linkage errors. This is mostly that your class path is not set up uh, correctly. Um, so that the, some code which was available at compile time is not there at run time, and when it tried to load the class, it couldn't find a, a class definition that it expected to be found. Um, <coughs> generally, you should find these in your integration testing layer um, because your, uh, your, your runtime environment for the integration test should be very similar to what your actual production runtime environment is. Um, so you should be able to avoid those. Exception and initializer is one that can kind of come out of left field. And the places where we've seen it are mostly due to bad, co uh, bad programming practice. Uh, an example would be uh, we had a class which loaded a icon over the internet in a static initializer. Um, so of course when that uh, icon loaded because the website wasn't available, uh, the class loading failed. Um, and unfortunately, in the way the JVM works, you don't get a second try. Uh, so that program was completely dead because it couldn't load a core class uh, because of some uh, temporary network failure. Um, hopefully, that, that's not a practice that most people uh, uh, would engage in. But uh, exception and initializer uh, is usually to do to something like that. Um, assertion error is uh, normally uh, used uh, by the assert keyword and also by uh, JUnit uh, for uh, um, uh, assertion failures. So you shouldn't really ever see this in production code. We did have one library which was generating assertion error kind of out of the blue um, unexpectedly in production. Uh, and that was, of course, uh, kind of a disaster for us. We were really mad at those guys for a little while. So, you know, avoid throwing ass assertion error. <coughs> so the summary of things to catch. Um, if, if it's a uh, informal exception or null, you should be handling it right away. So immediately after the method return, look at the result of the method um, and see if it's null and do the appropriate handling. Uh, there might be a few cases where you'll like assign it to a field and then do the, and then do the uh, uh, check later, but uh, in most cases you should try and handle it before you take any further action. Uh, same with runtime exception. Don't let it get very far, propagate it as, or handle it immediately, unless you're taking that strategy of just letting the entire meta operation fail. Uh, checked exceptions, wherever you're doing the remediation or uh, retry uh, behavior, um, and if it's an error or throwable, one of those kind of left, fit, left field things, uh, just let the backstop that you provided, that try, catch, throwable, uh, uh, handle it. So it's not all about exceptions. There are lots of other non-exception problems uh, related to concurrency, uh, deadlock, live lock, infinite loop stalls. We'll talk about those a bit now. Some of these you can avoid by adopting a strategy of uh, of separating computation and mutation. And this kind of really aligns well with the kind of move towards more functional style programming, where you do uh, computation using streams or another functional uh, idiom <coughs> to calculate some result, and then you apply that result to the object-oriented state. So you have fairly heavy weight state objects uh, you're not just continually manipulating fields all over the place and mixing computation and state uh, at the same time. Um, but instead, uh, you calculate some new state and then just stick it into the environment. Uh, uh, and thereafter, that particular uh, computation result uh, 
never changes again until it's completely replaced by a new computation result. Um, and that you know, replacement plan uh, avoids the possibility of anybody else in the program ever seeing an inconsistent state. They don't see your partially computed result. All they see is, I finished the result, it worked correctly, and then I installed it. Um, which avoids all kinds of problems. And you know, if, uh, um, if that's all you're doing, the only synchronization you may need to be doing in that environment is, is setting that field value to null, or sorry, to volatile. You may not need any more synchronization than that, which is a lot easier than having to have uh, synchronized, uh, 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 synchronized everywhere throughout your code and having to worry about um, <coughs> contention, et cetera. Um, So in general, try to, try to follow the style of, um, if you can make it immutable, great. Even best of all possible worlds. No thread, threading concerns at all. If you can't do that, then you make it fully concurrent. Um, so that um, you don't, uh, you handle the uh, uh, synchronization aspects. You can either use synchronization primitive or uh, things like concurrent map, et cetera. And kind of as a very last resort, do you make it mutable? Uh, because in the case where it's mutable, um, <coughs> it better be worked on by only one thread at a time. Um, so for that locking and blocking, um, synchronized is still very convenient. Um, if all you're doing, uh, Using synchronized for is to uh, preserve ordering um, or something that is never potentially blocking, like just adding to a list. Synchronized is great. Uh, synchronized becomes a problem when you have to block for long periods of time. Uh, and, it and you have resource starvation where contending things that are wanting to use the same resource are spending a lot of their time waiting for the resource to be available. Um, but in the case where it's non-blocking, it's, it's, it's hard to get more convenient than uh, synchronized. Um, <coughs> you should avoid, uh, you know, blocking on the, um, I'm just going to skip ahead a little bit here. So um, in the case of uh, concurrent, accesses, um, Java 8 introduced some new features that made these operations a lot easier. Things like uh, compute if absent, um, <coughs> um, the general uh, compute um, operation, um, and uh, more of compare and swap type operations. Um, that were, uh, that were harder before. Previously, even when you were using um, uh, concurrent map, I would see a lot of code which wasn't actually thread safe. They would do something like check to see if the field is in the, or if the value is in the map. If it isn't, then compute it, then put it back. Well, you had a data race condition there um, because you, you weren't handling the map correct, you weren't doing the, handling the map correctly. Um, Java 8 makes that a lot easier. Um, one of the, the data structures that we like a lot is both the copy on write array list and array set. And the reason for that is not that they're particularly high performance, but for um, cases that are fairly low mutation where you're not changing them often, such as things like those lists of listeners, um, they work great. And their iteration characteristics are, are really desirable, essentially. When you start iterating, you get a snapshot of the current state of the list, and it doesn't change while you're iterating. Um, and it's a lot lighter weight than, than something like concurrent, concurrent map. Um, we do use the kind of uh, bold lock that they provide, uh, as opposed to using the Java synchronized keyword for one feature, which is the try lock and try lock with timeout uh, capability, where we will ask to get the lock only if nobody else is holding it or 
will ask to get the lock, but only wait a certain amount of time for the lock to become available before giving up. The Java Synchronized Keyword doesn't offer those capabilities, um, so that once you've asked for the lock, you're kind of stuck waiting for it forever, potentially, uh, until somebody else gives it up. Um, and in a few cases, we have um, uh, locks where we have multiple conditions. Those would be things like the, is the list empty? Uh, is the list full? Uh, things like produ producer, consumer, queues, that kind of thing, where we have multiple conditions on the lock, whereas the normal synchronized keyword doesn't have uh, waiting on particular conditions. Um, thread pools. Well, don't write your own. Uh, you know, I, going back to the Java 5 days, Java 4, 1.4, it seemed like everybody had their own thread pool implementation. Um, it's kind of nice that uh, <coughs> those have now kind of all um, been thrown away in favor of the uh, executor service. And now in Java 8 and later, the fork join pool, or, or sorry, the fork join pool appeared in Java 7, but the common pool appeared in Java 8. Um, and this, uh, let, this got rid of everybody's uh, private thread pool implementations as well as uh, the, the timer task which had hor horrible characteristics. Um, so there are some issues still with thread pools in that you can't just you know, use the th fork join pool, common pool as the only pool in your, in your program. Um, even though it's available always, um, there's still the standard questions of how heavily is it being utilized? What if the behavior of any of the clients on that, uh, on that pool uh, is bad? Uh, how, well do you handle t how well does it handle task queuing? In general, if you're gonna make uh, heavy use of a thread pool, you should uh, make your own instance, not make your own implementation, just an instance, and sized appropriate for the number of tasks uh, um, you're gonna be uh, using. <laughs> with appropriate uh, task queuing characteristics. Um, task queuing in this case would refer to the number of tasks you're willing to have queued up that aren't currently executing but are waiting to execute it. If, for example, you have something that's very uh, um, jittery or spurty in terms of the way it generates data, so it generates a thousand items and then nothing for four hours, maybe it's okay to have a thousand tasks queued as long as you can complete them in a reasonable amount of time. For other stuff that's supposed to be, you know, lower latency, um, you should have a bound, on, you know, have a queue that's a bounded queue uh, that doesn't have um, <coughs> uh, this huge uh, potential queue uh, so that you can be sure that the task runs in a reasonable amount of time. You do want to still have a, 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 a small queue um, in most cases, there's only a few cases where you would have no queue at all and, and basically something comes up and it has to run on the thread immediately um, or it fails completely. Uh, but uh, um, some queue usually, usually does help uh, a bit. Um, <coughs> when you're running with your own thread pool, you still have one uh, um, issue that can happen is, is that if any of your tasks are blocking, uh, it doesn't matter how big you made the pool, uh, whether Q or um, uh, number of threads, uh, concurrent or number of concurrent threads, nobody's going to be making any progress. Uh, the kind of worst situation in the world is uh, I made a pool with eight threads. I now have a th uh, all eight threads occupied by running tasks. I have a thousand items in the queue and all eight of those threads are sitting waiting blocked on some operation, uh, not actually making any progress. Um, I probably have other work in the queue that could be happening uh, as a result of this, uh, <coughs> but isn't doing anything because of this blocked wait. Um, so avoiding, uh, you know, anything which is going to potentially block for long periods of time should be very much isolated potentially not in a pool at all. Uh, uh, it maybe should have its own private thread or be in a pool that uh, this amount of extreme blocking is um, anticipated. And as I said, these, this is where you do use threads uh, 
things that are run forever and, and block until needed can block for long periods of time. Holding multiple uh, locks simultaneously. Um, if you're using uh, the daemon status and thread priority, um, having a, a private thread is probably uh, pretty important. Um, and you've got to ask, you know, uh, is, is this task still disposable? Um, most of the time when you've got a thread, this is something that's rather important process and it should never die during the, uh, or the death of this thread should never be unplanned uh, during its execution. Um, <coughs> so unlike the future tasks or um, uh, executor pool stuff, threads are, are heavy enough weight and usually important enough to uh, um, keep them around. Um, so, you know, a summary of this would be uh, <coughs> use a thread if the execution is in depth, uh, if the amount of time you're going to run is indefinite or non not determined. Um, executors, if, it, you know, if you know it's going to run for a, a predictable amount of time and that's not, one, not an amount of time that's going to really hurt others, it's, it's not going to be a bad uh, sharer. Um, if you're going to be doing lots of blocking, you should consider a thread versus uh, rather than an executor. Um, and if you're doing uh, coordinated work between multiple threads, uh, you should definitely be considering a thread rather than an executor. Executor stuff works better if it's independent of other uh, tasks, um, with the exception of stuff you're doing via something uh, more reactive style like future um, uh, completable uh, or completable future. If you're doing something like completable future, you can you can have chained uh, executor tasks. But um, <coughs> in most cases, what you're doing on an executor should be pretty independent. And uh, you know, like the coordinated behavior of uh, concurrency, the state on a thread can be shared amongst multiple threads. Uh, whereas an executor, you should try and have the stuff that it's dealing with is only being manipulated by that uh, particular uh, task while it's doing it. And that goes back to the idea of computation versus mutation. One more safety feature that uh, you'll probably want is watchdogs uh, to preserve system reliability. We haven't really talked about ways to handle things like um, uh, runaway threads that are doing uh, infinite loops or um, Watchdogs are more often for watching a process that just uh, randomly dies. And the goal is to keep essential functions alive. So all the watchdog does is make sure that the other important things in the system are, are, uh, are happening. So they, they don't really do any work. Um, they, don't really advance, they don't advance the state of the software uh, in terms of performing the software's function. They just make sure that it's working and nothing else. Uh, well, they do one other thing, which is if they notice that it's going bad, they kill it and restart it. That's their, that's their kind of two roles are watch and restart. Um, <coughs> and one of the things that the watchdog will have to have is some definition of progress. So when it's looking at this other task that it's monitoring, it has to decide uh, what that task's definition of progress is. You know, has it, has it processed any more tasks? Has its queue continued to grow? Um, in the case of things like infinite loop or stalled, has it reached checkpoints uh, recently? Um, uh, et cetera. So <coughs> the one thing that watchdogs have, do have to have is, is that what, just watching isn't really enough. Um, they do have to have some mitigation strategy uh, to recover uh, should they discover that uh, uh, something has gone bad. Um, so when you decide what should be done uh, if the thing goes bad, that's when you can consider writing a watchdog process for uh, that particular task. It's like, okay, I know when this thing goes bad that this happens. I'll write a task that periodically makes to check that particular state. Um, and because of you know, things like uh, the fact that it could end up in uh, a queue itself if the, if the executor it's running on is slow, you might want to make it a private thread uh, just for safety reasons so that it doesn't have to contend with anybody else in order to perform its job. 
Um, so it ends up kind of looking like very old style Java, co Java code and that uh, it does the uh, thread.sleep itself um, <coughs> rather than uh, 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 scheduled executor dot uh, scheduled. Uh, an example would be, um, a, this was for a project that we had that uh, we had a scheduled future that was dying in production. Uh, due to a NPE that was being thrown by uh, a component. And it was happening pretty uh, uh, infrequently. But we were already in the middle of a mission. And um, the scheduled future, uh, <coughs> um, a live task that was there for uh, scheduling the, act uh, so the action in the system to be happened didn't bother to check to see if the existing task was done. Um, it just checked to see whether the schedule future existed or not, and if it didn't exist, then it created a new one. Um, but because we were in the middle of a mission, it was impossible to update this. What we needed to do was check to see not just whether the schedule future had been created already, but, but whether it was still running. Um, so we couldn't do a full system update, but we could install a plugin. And what we did was uh, that plugin used reflection to access the system state and essentially performed a watchdog function on this. Uh, and when it detected that the scheduled future had, had died, <coughs> which, had, which had died because it didn't have a backstop um, and the executor service had killed it, all it did was uh, null out the field so that the next time through the main uh, uh, program which already had a check for does the schedule future need to exist would decide oh I need to create the schedule future because it doesn't exist. Um, so this was kind of an example of adding in a uh, watchdog to a running system while it was in the ocean uh, uh, hundreds of miles from shore uh, which was kind of a fun experience. Uh, kind of the most uh, uh, dangerous uh, software update you kind of ever wanted to attempt. Uh, it'd be like changing the lunar lander code while it's uh, descending towards the moon, but it uh, uh, wasn't quite as bad as that. <coughs> so what we've been doing with this, uh, you know, uh, approach, I said they, these robots can run for, you know, more than a year out at sea, and they're, they're semi-autonomous in that uh, uh, you tell them, you know, what mission you want them to perform, like patrol this area, but the individual decisions that they take uh, are largely up to them while, that, while they're following that mission. And they'll just kind of report back their GPS location and battery level uh, and mission progress uh, on a periodic basis. But uh, unless you see something going wrong, um, like the current is too strong and they're drifting out of the operational area, uh, they don't need any help from you. Um, um, these numbers are actually uh, now tiny. Um, w the longest mission we still we have is still about the same length. That was from Pitcairn Island back to Hawaii. Um, the, U the UK government uh, contracted us to do fisheries monitoring of Pitcairn, which is one of the most isolated places on Earth. Um, and uh, so we sent a robot out there to listen for boats, and each boat's engine and prop signature is kind of unique. Uh, so that once we had recordings of them, we could go back to the harbors in Chile and Peru and wait for those same prop signatures to show up and say, uh, hey guys, where you been? Um, <coughs> and the fishermen pretty, well, pretty quickly learned that they could no longer fish uh, illegally off Pitcairn. But uh, um, going to back to Pitcairn to pick up the robot, is extremely expensive. It'd be about two hundred thousand dollars for a mission to to Pitcairn to get the robot back. So we just said, "Hey, why don't we just sail it back to Hawaii? There's nothing in the way." Um, so it spent seven months uh, sailing back from Pitcairn to uh, to Hawaii, uh, completely independently. We just drew a single line. Here, you know, here's where you are. Here's where you want to go. That's your mission. Um, unfortunately, there's not much current at the uh, equator, so it's, it kind of went up into the west, then got stuck at the equator for five months, 
kind of just dawdling around because it couldn't get currents that would cross the equator. Um, <coughs> and then a storm came, blew it across the equator, and then it just chugged onto Hawaii and was home in a week and a half. Um, but it kind of spent a long time just waiting for the right day uh, to cross the equator. Um, a total number of miles were now over two and a half million since this was done in 2018, or 17, sorry. <coughs> and it's a lot of fun making robots, and feel free to ask me any questions about it. I'll have another presentation tomorrow. Um, this uh, software stack that runs on the robots was originated by uh, James Gosling, uh, the guy who uh, uh, originated Java. And uh, I've had the fortune with work of working with him on a variety of projects over the years. Uh, so I have another presentation tomorrow, which is about uh, what I've learned from reading James's code. Um, and uh, he, he, he heard that I was doing this presentation again here, and his answer was, oh, God. Uh, but uh, uh, it, it should be a fun talk as well. Um, thank you. Yeah, sure. So, um, one of these things, I missed the beginning, but yep. I guess these colliders are not really connected to the internet? No, they're, they're not connected. To, when they're within 12 miles of shore, roughly, we can use cell service to, 3G cell service to, uh, to SSH into them and have a, they have a web UI, et cetera. But most of the time, the, their only connection to the world is an Iridium modem. And um, the Iridium service that we get is uh, six 300-byte packages every five minutes. That's the service level guarantee that they provide. Um, so that's when I said, you know, the, the robot's really only sending its GPS location and battery level and not a lot else. We do send some telemetry packets like, did I see a submarine or not? Um, so the question I have is, that since you use a plug-in and then reflection to do something, does that mean all the code is run privileged, basically? Yeah, so the code is all... No security? No, there's no security really on the robot because the only internet connection is via Iridium, which the entire U.S. military is also powered by, so it's pretty secure. Yeah. <laughs> um, we, they have you know, very strong controls on the shore side, um, how we inject data into that uh, system, then we can only talk to our particular robots, et cetera. Um, but yes, we did download a six kilobyte plugin over Iridium. Um, we have a, a little file handler that will receive packets in order um, and reassemble them into a file, which it then loaded as a plugin. So a software update via Iridium was pretty, uh, <laughs> Uh, pretty novel. I think that may be the only time Java code has been downloaded over Iridium. Wow. <laughs> and the, the other question I have is, so it, as you said, it was, it was drifting around for five months, coming from picture and after. Did that wait by the ever collide with something else? Yeah, so there have been some collisions of wave gliders with other things. Um, the US Navy, for example, bought a wave glider from us and then we're learning how to pilot it down in San Diego at Coronado. Um, most ships commercially have something called AIS, which is automa uh, called automatic identification of ships, which is where a ship broadcasts its uh, size, direction, course, speed, etc. Nuclear aircraft carriers don't. <laughs> uh, so it they bought a robot and then ran it over. <laughs> Uh, we've also had robots that were crushed between icebergs. Um, and we've had uh, robots that were picked up by uh, Indonesian and, and Brazilian fishermen. Uh, but it was like the one that you saw for the Antarctic. Uh, um, it has that snorkel looking thing, which they correctly, uh, where is it here? They. Cor uh, it's not coming up. It's got a snorkel looking thing that they correctly deduced was an HD camera. Uh, so they, th they th decided maybe they better throw it back in the water. Um, so we have pictures of the guys smoking on their boat <laughs> before, they, uh, before they threw it back in the water. So do you need to retrieve them to get whatever data back essentially or are you able to upload? <coughs> so 
We can do upload off of them if they're within the cell range. Um, we also have other solutions. Some of the uh, missions that are out there for long periods of time uh, use a, um, a different modem technology from Iridium called BGAN, um, which is much faster. It's the one that's used f when you're getting data on an, air on an airplane, you know, that lousy low-speed data that you can get your email with. They, they use that for, uh, for uploading data, but it's extremely power-hungry. Uh, it's kind of uh, spend two days charging your batteries for full, turn on the BGAN modem, upload everything you have within an hour, um, and then uh, go back to charging your batteries and collecting data. Um, uh, those are the main solutions that we use. We're really looking forward to the Iridium Next and things like the uh, 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 SpaceX constellation that will give us much better uh, and cheaper satellite data throughout the world. Because Iridium right now is, oh, that, remember that, f that um, uh, um, f five or, uh, or six 300 byte messages in a five minute period? They also charge us a dollar for each one. <laughs> so the, the data costs add up pretty quickly uh, on Iridium as well. Hopefully what comes after is a lot cheaper. Cool. Yeah, go for it. So we do a, a fair bit of static analysis. Um, uh, you know, the normal, um, uh, not PM, PMD, it used to be PMD we were using and then uh, find bugs. Um, but what we have found more valuable is uh, uh, code coverage uh, as well as uh, pit testing, which is mutation testing, um, which is, so mutation testing is where uh, you're testing your tests essentially to make sure that the tests are any good. So they make random mutations to your code to do things like return null from this function which isn't documented return null. And if your test still works, well, you weren't checking for null. Um, so then you have to write more tests which proves that your code was inadequate as well. Uh, so mutation testing has been really useful uh, for us as well. Um, Beyond that has been the practice of using a very small number of idioms or styles within the code uh, so that everything kind of is done in exactly the same style across the source base. Um, and it's a very simple uh, uh, style. It's not, not fancy in any way. Um, you know, kind of following the uh, be obvious first rule. Uh, uh, what's uh, the, the Tony Hoare quote is, there's two ways you can write code. One is so that there's obviously no bugs, and the other is that there's no obvious bugs. Um, <laughs> we try and follow the former uh, uh, approach. So the, this project doesn't use real-time Java. We just use uh, Azul Zulu embedded uh, with a server VM, um, which is the one unusual part. Most people are surprised that we're using server VM but uh, rather than client VM, but startup time isn't really a consideration um, when your missions run for six months. Um, we would rather have a steady state which uses less power, uh, so we use uh, server VM. Um, part of the reason is, is that we don't need Java real time for what we're doing on, on this device. The control loop is five seconds uh, and, the, and the robot only moves about walking speed. Uh, so there's not really any hard real time uh, or even soft real time uh, performance needs in this particular project. Uh, real time Java, Java still does exist. There's the uh, Jamaica VM uh, guys in Europe uh, they're now up to Java 8 compatibility. For a long time, there were Java 5 compatible real-time Java VMs, but um, you can now do Java 8 or I think Java 10 code uh, is, what they're, is what they're up to. Uh, 
Um, and their main targets are industrial automation and, uh, and military applications. I, w I wish that there was more um, real-time Java and real-time in general. I can't understand why media operating systems like phones that play videos and stuff like that aren't real-time operating systems. Uh, it would be so much better for things like video playback and gaming and uh, making telephone calls uh, where you had some kind of hard real-time guarantee and didn't have to write it in C. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> yeah, I, I thought that was hilarious about the new iPhone 11 advertisement, or the new, I, new iPhone 11 Pro was all about the new camera, and they didn't mention that the device now has ultra wideband. <laughs> Apparently the phone thing is completely secondary. <laughs> 